Manukau needs no introduction, and I'm not sure how he fits all of this on his business card. But Manukau is the Associate Professor at Te Arahu, the University of Auckland School of Business. He's the Associate Dean of Māori and Pacific Development at the University of Auckland. He's the founder of the Mira Sazazi Research Centre at the University of Auckland and also the academic coordinator of the Huanga Māori Masters Programme in the University of Auckland Graduate School of Business. Will you please help me in welcoming Manuka to the stage? Tinapuetau. <coughs> The Fenu Arangatira or Taranaki Krangamai Tenakwe, it the Manu Corridor, it the Atanei, Parehoka, Tenakwe, Ekara, Moto Fakaro Pai, Kiamato Kutatumai, it the Fenu Arangatira. To the Mayor and Deputy Mayor, also my, uh, my greetings uh, and uh, greetings to us all. Um, I'm, I always get nervous when I'm in the presence of Taranaki people because um, uh, largely because the, um, in the 1820s a, a substantial number of Taranaki <laughs> came to live in the Hokianga. <laughs> and and um, my auntie Quinda Cooper of course uh, connects directly to Taranaki and uh, so uh, I always have the sense of kind of being home uh, and, and at the same time being part of the Hokianga, uh, where I'm from, of course. Um, so when I get this little twitch, I don't know which is the Hokianga or Taranagi, that's the twitch. <laughs> um, well, what we're going to cover today is uh, quite a lot of Maori philosophy, as a matter of fact, uh, trying to explore this idea of what is the good life uh, in Māori terms? Um, and, um, but I need to say that uh, when we talk about such ideas as this, then our ideas are not solely Māori because they are also Polynesian. Uh, and if we go back further enough, they become East Polynesian. And if we go back 5,000, 6,000 years, then we are the descendants of a great uh, one of the greatest trading blocks in human history called the Austronesians, five or six thousand years, and we are the end result of five or six thousand years of economic and, and, and political endeavour. And our languages, our language, our dialects uh, can all be traced back in towards uh, uh, Java, Taiwan, parts of India, across to Madagascar. Uh, that is our heritage. And, um, and yet it is the side of our history that we uh, tend not to give too much focus on. But in a world that's globalizing, it's important now that uh, we look past the arrival of the canoe. We look to the departure of the canoes and we look to uh, a past that's uh, led our people to come into East Polynesia uh, two, three, five thousand years ago. Uh, three weeks ago, a group of Māori from uh, largely the Bay of Islands uh, went to a conference 
in Malaysia, funded by uh, this, uh, the Sultan of Brunei. And that conference gave focus to this endeavour. Can we imagine a resurgence Aust Austronesian uh, economy, which currently would um, embody about um, 300 to 400 million people, and, um, and look at that economy that would exchange, range from Madagascar right through Southeast Asia up towards Taiwan right, right, right through the Pacific. It is possible in today's globalising world to imagine and then plan for such, uh, a, such a way of thinking. So this is something of the context in which I'm going to offer some thoughts. Our focus is on uh, Taranaki and, um, and in particular some work that a group of us did at the University of Auckland Business School which looked at uh, the extent of poverty in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, in the Medicine Centre, we took that um, research done by other co uh, colleagues and looked at the Māori Pacifica um, context of, of poverty. It's the first major piece of research done on uh, the nature of poverty among Māori and Pacific Islanders. And it's not good news, as, we'll, as we will see. Uh, <coughs> so, um, Oops, I've got to drive this thing. Okay. So what we're going to look at then is um, uh, Taranaki as a starting point, of course, and what's our understanding of the good life and what's our understanding of poverty. And I want to discuss um, the need to shift uh, in our mindset from welfareism to uh, what is called a new political way of looking at, at the quality of life that's a capabilities approach. And the capabilities approach offers us a way of measuring well-being in Māori terms. And this means that we must no longer compare ourselves to someone else. We compare ourselves to ourselves. And that we are the ones to define the quality of life and what constitutes a good life, not trying to live someone else's good life, which usually is a, a nightmare. And so, uh, so that's, that's what we will try to explore th uh, this morning. And uh, the question that uh, was raised, uh, was given to me also, as, as with us all, how so, how is it that Taranaki Fano will regain its wealth over the next 60 years? So it's the next 60 years that we'll also be giving focus to. So most of what I'm trying to offer today is um, is a, a way of looking at the next six, 50, uh, 60 years. Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this, this stuff called Māori capabilities and uh, how do we define a quality of life uh, in Māori terms. Well, the, hi the recent history of Taranaki, it's not for me to traverse this, but it's been well documented. And um, in my years of working in Taranaki and, and and visiting um, many, many of the Marae in the, in, the, in the region. There's a lot of history that one soaks up simply by being here, and, and the mayor's alluded to that. Um, but uh, in preparation for, for, for the Wananga today, I thought I would better just read um, 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 parts of the Taranaki report, and um, because it, it seems to sum it up quite nicely um, in a uh, the tragedy of the story is summed up nicely, that's what I meant. And, um, and so we know that the 21 claims for the whole of the Taranaki district, uh, it involved canvas the land wars, confiscations, and ended up with the story of Parihaka. Um, and um, a point I'd like to just make here though, if we put the, the, the Taranaki economy, say from the 1800s to the 1860s, as part of the then Māori economy of the same period. And we look at it from a macro point of view, which is to say, let's look at it from an Asia-Pacific point of view. Then our ancestors' economic activity linked together with the endeavours of China, Indonesia, 
Malaysia, Korea, Japan. This is the part of the world that for nearly a thousand years have produced 50 to 60 per cent of global gross domestic product. So the wealth of the world has historically been speaking, uh, speaking has historically been speaking, has been generated in our part of the world. The tragedy of our part of the world is that the colonisation experience, which we experienced, you have experienced, uh, led to the decline of our capabilities to produce wealth. And we became the underclass, the poor ones, the poverty-stricken ones, as has China, Indonesia, <laughs> Japan, Korea, Malaysia, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so for the last 200 years, uh, the gross domestic product, the global gross domestic product shifted to Europe and North America. But in today's world, with the re-emergence of China, India, Indonesia and the Pacific, and I would argue the Maori economy, uh, we are returning back to where we have always historically belonged to be part of the world that produces um, um, over 50 to 60 percent of global gross domestic product. Currently, Japan and or the Asian countries uh, are now generating uh, just over 50, 55 percent of gross domestic product at a global scale. Countries like India are doing phenomenal work. Do you know that um, Every year, for the last 20 years, they've been able, India has been able to take 1% of its total population up over the poverty line. They've been doing it for 20 years, 1% over the last 20 years. China has been doing something similar. So we are watching the rebirth of an ancient way of running economies. And um, and the, that is a good context, I think, for Taranaki, Māori and the Pacific to consider what we are doing, put it into the big picture, and then we can see where the momentum is. So our struggle is no longer a struggle solely in terms of Aotearoa. It is the struggle of Asia to reassert its rightful place, historically speaking, and the Pacific. Um, so that's a, just an extract from the Taranaki report and um, I, I won't read it out because it's, it's well known but, it's, um, but the Waitangi Tribunal talked of the tragedy of, um, um, of, of what happened in the 1860s, 70s and 1880s and so on and so forth and the fact that the tragedy to a certain extent continues and I guess this is the point to today's wānanga is to, to see what to do for the next 60 years. Um, now, I want to quickly discuss this particular issue, which is called the paradox of wealth creation. And the paradox of wealth creation um, is not necessarily a popular concept here, because since I've been uh, talking a lot about it, uh, um, uh, I've had some most interesting range of comments um, particularly from, from senior politicians. Um, but uh, the paradox is simply this. In any given society, um, the more wealth that is created by that society, the more poverty is created also. And that's the paradox. Because the intention is to create wealth for the good of everybody. But the reality is that not everybody benefits from wealth creation. Historically, that's the the nature of economic activities. And some people have a theory called the trickle-down theory. Uh, well, um, and that works for some people. It does trickle down to them. But there's a lot of people, including Maori in New Zealand's history, uh, we're lucky if we get a mist, let alone the trickle. <laughs> and it's dealing with how to get out of the mist part of the economic endeavour to actually maybe running our own economy for our own purposes. And that's one of the most wonderful reasons to be alive today, because the opportunity now exists and make it possible. 
Um, so that's the, uh, the, that's the paradox. And uh, New Zealand, despite our diff economic difficulties today, is producing more wealth than we have ever, ha ever done in the last 150 to 20 years. Yet, as we will see, Māori poverty has remitted, uh, risen dramatically. And poverty among Pacific Islanders has risen dramatically. Poverty among poor <coughs> Pākehā people has risen dramatically. And yet all this at a time of extraordinary ex um, wealth creation over the last 20 or 30 years. So something is systemically wrong somewhere. Um, and so the answer to, to the paradox is to, for modern societies to have what is referred to as a double strategy. To be conscious that one needs to create wealth for the common good of all the citizens, but make sure that poverty uh, does not exist. And so you need a poverty removal strategy. Most of the, the European countries, despite their predicament, have a double strategy. Most of the Asian countries have double strategies. I'm giving the example of India and China. And uh, we don't. So I think it's, uh, it's for Māori to develop a double strategy. And this applies to our use of all the returning assets and the way that our various trust boards and Māori companies and so on and so forth uh, uh, plan their business and economic activities. It's not enough to create more wealth for Māori because there will be Māori poverty created this time by Māori wealth creators. And so where is the double strategy? And the challenge I put to all iwi and all hapu planning is to plan also to remove your poverty because if you don't, the gap will widen and then it gets so wide it's no longer possible to close. And then you learn to live with the reality that some will never be, enjoy the benefits of economic endeavour. So um, I put at the bottom of the slide this thought. He tangata well-being is the fundamental good of economic development that has to be the purpose for which we do Māori business and economic activity. He tangata well-being is the fundamental good of our economic endeavour. Um, and this assumption is linked to the idea that the central ill economic development should be designed to address is human poverty. The reason why we create wealth is to remove poverty. And um, this, I think, this way of thinking constitutes a Māori theory of economic development. And we're all going to need to explore it at greater depth to, as to what we mean by it. And that wealth poverty question is, is the way of doing it. Tikanga wise, it's clear that the history of all our whānau, hapu, and iwi, and so on and so forth, was based around the need to ensure that any Māori at any generation had all they needed to be a Māori. That was the fundamental philosophical proposition of our culture which traced back into the Pacific and into Southeast Asia. And nothing has changed today. The difference today is we actually do have some opportunities to, to control, to manage economic activity on our terms with our worldview. So a Maori philosophical theory is what I'm trying, is what I think we should explore, explains the importance of both growth and equity. If our theory does not have that notion of growth and equity at the same time, then we have a theory that we, we should throw away. Thus, it is a principal basis for making choices at policy for, um, uh, always, for always requires uh, why. Um, well, the policy formulation always requires uh, a he tangata well-being as its fundamental value. Now, to a certain extent, I guess I am challenging the notion that the fundamental purpose of economic um, 
develop this iwi development. Be, the, I, the, the he tangata preceded the iwi. That is our fundamental proposition. You are born he tangata first, and you enter uh, whānau, hapu, iwi in that order. It's not the other way around. All right, so I want to just uh, nicely challenge the notion that iwi development is the driver. It's he tangata development is the driver. Um, and so this philosophical uh, way of thinking is, is, is actually quite important. It is uh, the basis of a Māori notion of the good life. Now let's have a look then uh, at what's, what's happening, what the future can look like in terms of a uh, he tangata well-being approach. The Burl study which came out last year uh, which has looked at the Māori economy from 2001 to 2006 and then looked at what, can the, what will the Māori economy look like to 2060 at 50 years uh, is extraordinary. Um, and um, so we see that uh, in 2006 our total wealth created was 16.4 billion by 2010, it's 36.9 billion. Now, a lot of the growth uh, was uh, simply through the fact we got better statistics, but a lot of it actually is real growth, and so it's important to remember that. But the increase of 20 to 20.5 um, billion is significant. The wider coverage and more robust assumptions uh, are necessary, taking into account price inflation and real growth and so on and so forth. Māori economy has had a real growth from 2006 to 2010 of 18%. New Zealand economy has not had such a growth rate. And on a per capita, on an annual basis, New Zealand economy is not growing at 4.3%. The only economy that's growing at 4.3% in New Zealand is the Māori one. And so that when we look at the next, um, after the next 60 years, then we can see that we have the potential to um, be growing at a, an annual rate, uh, a rate of 12 billion extra per annum in gross domestic product. That is the potential, right? And if we follow a strategy of the status quo, we will, be, uh, we will not reach that target as well as the growth uh, in terms of, of um, the $12 billion, uh, 12 billion 150,000 additional jobs can be created by Māori for Māori purposes. Right? If we carry on the way we are, there will be $35,000 uh, less jobs. We have no option but to use innovation, new technologies, new ideas to grow the wealth and at the, grow the jobs. Um, and so my conclusion here is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that in wealth creation terms, Māori are a sustainable community now. Our question is, how sustainable are we going to be in 50, 60 years time? We currently pay our way. The ironies of life is that the public perception is that we're a tax burden. We're a burden on the New Zealand taxpayer. Um, and that's because of this incessant um, look at Māori on welfare benefits. But in fact, we pay our taxes, and the irony is that we, uh, as a group, pay more taxes than we need to. It's not that I don't think we're extra generous. I think it's just we haven't learned the art of not paying taxes. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's something to be developed. Okay. Um, but anyway, the point is that we are currently a self-sustaining community and, um, and we can be in the future. But, as I said there at the bottom last, that poverty will also be created. And there is a scenario already, I want to suggest it, that um, a spectre is already on the horizon, which is we'll, we will have asset-rich tribes and more poor Maori people. And, and, and that's, that, that is a, something for us to look at. Thus, I think we need to put not the iwi at the, as the focus, 
of our economic development, but he tangata, well-being, is the focus. All right. Now, here's some data on the poverty levels at the moment. Um, um, there are currently in New Zealand 200,000 New Zealand children living in poverty. Many of them in abject poverty, not just poverty, abject poverty. And of that 200,000, uh, 100,000 are Māori and Pacific Islanders. Another 100,000, 60,000 Māori children under 14 live in poverty. That is one third. And the way the poverty equation goes is this, and this is what concerns me because this is not a matter of a gap between rich and poor, this is now chasm, and this is a gap, economically speaking, that cannot be closed on current practices. And so, uh, I'll just paint this picture because the, these are young ones who are, uh, are suffering the most. If you take a one-year-old child, a three-year-old child, and a five-year-old child who are living in poverty, that can only mean that the two parents are also living in poverty. Right? They're not earning enough to pay their way. In an extended family system, one would assume that if a couple, a parents, are, are not, don't have enough to live a good life, then other members of the kinship group would be supporting them. So if the parents are in poverty, it must mean that the kinship group around the parents are also in poverty. The uncles, the grandparents are not earning enough to look after both the parents. You see the picture? And, um, and that means in the wider community, uh, something terrible has happened. Now, to change that, where you've got one, two, nearly four generations of people all living in poverty. This makes it a systemic problem in my mind. And so it's not a matter of a three-year intervention program by any particular government. All that's going to do is just take a little bit of pain away, the pain of poverty. So this is very, very dramatic. And my, my guess is, and some of my economic colleagues in the business school think I'm pessimistic, they argued that with massive state intervention, we can remove the poverty in New Zealand um, uh, in 10 or 15 years. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as that. I put it into a 30-year cycle. So over the next 50 years, we need to create more wealth, but we also need to attack the poverty of our people. And that, that calls for a lot of strategic planning and a lot of uh, new thinking. Okay. Uh, I paint a picture now, therefore, uh, some more philosophy, but um, this is an attempt to describe um, our code of ethics, traditionally speaking, and, um, and define in, in our terms what constitutes a good life, philosophically speaking, right? um, and how we might apply it to well-being. So, the definition of Māori tanga that um, we're used to is that um, needs to be changed. My proposition is that today Māori tanga consists of four well-beings. There's spiritual well-being, environmental well-being, Mother Earth. There's family kinship family um, well-being. We love our kinship system. And then there's economic well-being. Those four well-beings have, need to be considered all at once and planned for. And if we look then at our uh, moral codes, um, then we have something like, I think it's 13 or 14 virtues. Some cultures are happy with seven, but not us. We must be picky or something, but anyway. But historically speaking, so there are some of them there. And um, the virtue of Tao Marama, the virtue of Tao Hurihuri, the virtue of Wairua Tanga, Modi, Tapu, Mana, Ho, and um, Tikanga Tangata, the virtue of the human person, the virtue of the Fano, of the Fanonga Tanga, Manaki, Kutahi Tanga, Tiaki Tanga, Huhu, Huhu Romo, the virtue. All of these are our virtues. And this is where we will find our understanding of the good life. When a Māori is able to live all these things, there's the measure of the good life. Anything less 
means you you're not living the life that we would aspire to. Okay, um, and um, now what we haven't been able to do is develop um, some uh, measures. How do you measure those things? Okay, well we can discuss those things. A quick reference to um, 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 the Treaty of Waitangi. Because in the Treaty of Waitangi, particularly in, in the preamble, we will find a notion of the good life. The Queen Victoria guaranteed that the good life as Māori defined it would be protected. It's in the preamble is the most important principles, not in the articles. Right? So look to the preamble. And so um, the lasting peace and good life, the notion of a quenua rangatira, uh, and the Ata Noho principle. Okay? Uh, I've made reference to Hipokapu Tango Tarangatira Tango Nutireni. Uh, I don't know the Taranaki position on the Declaration of Independence of 1835, but it's part, this is a fundamental part of the uh, Ngapui claim today. Ngapui is saying to the tribunal, we did not cede sovereignty. We never intended it, it was taken. And that's what the, uh, the tribunal is hearing the Ngapui claim. And they're basing it on, on, on Hepakaputanga, the Declaration of Independence, and, um, and the treaty is in the context. So the treaty in the context of the Declaration of Independence is a treaty of trade, not a treaty of cession. And that's a, quite a fundamental change. And in the preamble, uh, Queen Victoria promised the world that Māori life as Māori values designed it would be gu uh, guaranteed. And there's the wording. Ki e tohungi e ki a rātou, o rātou rangatiratanga me tō rātou whenua, ki a mau tonu hoki te rongo, ki a rātou me te āta noho hoki. It's a beautiful little expression, this. Beautiful expression. And this is my translation of it. The English versions don't say this, but the translation of it is to preserve to them their full authority as leaders and their country and that lasting peace, te rongo, may always be kept with them in continued life as Māori people. Ata noho, continued life. That's what the Queen guaranteed. And, um, okay, just looking, looking from... Um, oh, there it is, yeah. Okay. Okay, I won't delve too much along on this, but there's some thoughts on well-being. It's taken from the Stanford uh, University um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, just to give you something to think about. But well-being is uh, most commonly used in philosophy to describe what is good for a person. In our case, we would say a person and their group. Right? Um, the question of what well-being consists of is of great importance in moral philosophy. Okay? And uh, but we know the term well-being is used, but it's narrowed down to health mainly. But our notion of maritanga says it's more than health. It has to be spiritual well-being, our kinship well-being, our economic well-being, and our environmental well-being. Is that fair enough? So we, we come at it from a different, from a broader base. And, um, and in this case, health, as we talk about it today, is a part of the one's total well-being. And now, and I'm a bit sensitive, I'm trying to be sensitive here, but if we look at the early descriptions of Māori tanga from our early leaders, political leaders, Ta Apinana Ngata, Ta Turi Carroll, and Ta Tarangi Hiro, and so on, you'll find that they tended to talk of Māori tanga strictly in cultural terms, covering the first three, spiritual, kinship, and Mother Earth. But they never included economics. Their assumption was our purpose was to work in someone else's economy and make do. But if we go back to pre-treaty times, then the economy is definitely part of our definition of the Māori tanga. We need to recapture that early understanding that the economy consists of the four is an important part of our Māori tanga today. Okay? And uh, how do we measure this Māori tanga? Well, that's a very good question. I don't, know, don't yet have the answers to it. But again, in terms of um, some thinking about uh, economy. If we were to describe our economy as an economy of mana, then underneath, and under, 
underneath that word mana are all those virtues. All those 13 virtues add up to mana. Okay? And we can then use some economic language and talk of spiritual well-being is a form of spiritual capital. And spiritual capital is simply the spirituality of economics. All the research shows that most entrepreneurs, most innovators, are driven by something outside of themselves. Call it God if you wish, but call it something else, all right? That is where the inspiration for innovation and entrepreneurship comes from. The environmental capital, because we're very good at this today, we know how to measure it. Social, cultural capital, Mario strong in this. And we're now in the third, in the fourth one, economic capital, gaining uh, new strengths with materials, land and resources. To look, Ikawiti made a prophecy for North Aucklanders in 1847, just after he fought the British Army to a standstill. And, and, um, and he said to his people, we are going to become poor white Pākehā. Poor white Pākehā can be, is, is a transliteration of the word boys. He said, we will be the boys of the Pākehā. He was predicting we would become the chief labour force of the Pākehā settlers. And that is where we've been. Where we are historically now, at the moment is in transition from being a cheap labour force for someone else to being the, uh, a labour force for our own economic activity. And this mental shift is very, very important to behold and grab onto. Right? And, and as well as those other things. Now, in brief terms, this kind of economy of affection, um, the Nobel Prize winner is the last five, six years have been getting in economics, have been developing this idea of identity economics. And identity, identity economics um, uh, is, is evident today. All the dynamic economies of the world today uh, are the economies where the culture is clear, their values are clear, and they now link values, vision, and productivity together. And the Islamic economies are clear where they're going. The halal economy, as they call it, is now $2.3 trillion. All right? The Chinese economy is on the rise. The two areas of the world where identity is unclear is Europe and North America. That may explain why they're underperforming economically, why they're in chaos. They're absolutely confused about their identities and the values that go with it. Um, now, I'll just leave these 10 capabilities uh, for you to consider. But these are uh, the suggestions, um, uh, the new political philosophy that we could take on board. These capabilities are culturally neutral. They apply to all cultures. And uh, um, Martha Nussbaum has them. There's 10 of them about, um, and these are the measurables you make. So you look at life, being able to live the end of a human life in normal length. There's no reason why we should die before anybody else. All right? There's no reason why our people should be dying prematurely. There is no reason why our people should be living in poverty. And bodily health is another one. We do those measurements. Um, the other one is bodily integrity. Uh, the next one is... Um, our senses. These are all the measurements of a good human life. Eh? Uh, about developing the imagination, your thought, thinking, and so on and so forth. Um, the full use of one's emotions. The pr able to reason, to think independently and for oneself and for others that you serve. The capability of affiliation, the eight, your capability, are we capable of aligning with other species, our trees, our mountains, um, other species on the, on the earth, and are we able to play, and, um, and then our control over our environment, both the political environment and the material environment. All these capabilities are now possible for Maori. 
Now, these are the new ways of measuring pro progress in contrast to, say, the gross domestic one, which is a statistical, um, a statistical um, way of measuring. See, statistically, we're not supposed to be poor. And, 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 but we know the reality of it. So um, I'd like to just then uh, finish on, on those. And you've got other thoughts there, capability approach, and leave you to ponder on those things um, uh, and understand the, the differences between um, the different ways of measuring our well-being and finish up on this. How do you get there? How do you create wealth? Well, this is some of the latest stuff out of the Harvard Business School. First of all, do you need to build a culture of trust and innovation and then collaborate? Maori wealth will not be done if we stay fragmented. What we'll have is small pockets of wealth and large po pockets of poverty. So how to build a culture of trust and innovation within Maori tanga and then collaborate on a scale we're not used to doing, how to build communities and bring minds together, communities of trust, and then how do we convince people that we need to work together even though they don't want to. Right? So inspire them with a vision, convince them that other collaborators are vital, prevent any one party from benefiting so much that others feel their contributions are exploited. I get the same reaction when I'm speaking like this at home, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and find in building uh, collaborative enterprises, create a culture of trust, we've done all those, and the four organisational efforts uh, need to be done. So I'll leave you with all those thoughts, and then finally, um, some thoughts on uh, developing measures called the Human Development Index. Our government is supposed to be doing this, but they're not capable yet of doing it. No government in the last 20 years has been able to do this. And yet there, it is a major commitment with the World Bank, the UN system, and so on and so forth. So New, New Zealand is flagging behind. So, e homa. Ane na whakaro ki a tātou katoa, ki a koutou, ki a tātou katoa. He mihi nui ki a koutou, ki a kaha, ki a manua nui, ki a tapu. I think we've got time for just one or two questions. Does anybody have some questions they'd like to ask? Colleen was going to be running around with the microphone. Yeah, uh, Bobby Jay's got the mic there. Yeah. Apartheid. I think he blew them away. <coughs> Left no uh, questions. I have a question. What, what came across there was very good, thank you. But the valuable final product, what is it? My question. For all that and what you've said, what is the valuable final product at the end of it all? Thank you. I think the valuable final product is hitangata well-being. That's it. That's the point. He tangata, well-being. And that includes everybody who's he tangata. That's right. Bimbi. Uh, uh, kia ora. Thank you very much for your presentation. The, 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 the quarter that scares me that you presented today was um, how do we close that poverty gap? Because we're actually communal people. We aren't individuals, Māori. We've got it down here, we're, we're whānau, we're hapu, and we're iwi. How could you see that, doing that in that 30 years that you, you have a view of? I know this is a start to it, but... Um, well, it's, it's, um, it's, that's, 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 that was the suggestion how to start building. There's a lot of mistrust in the Māori community. You know that, I know that. Hey. 
and uh, it comes out when there's no Pākehās around. <laughs> that's when you see it. That's when you see it flourishing, unfortunately. So that's why this is specifically geared, aimed at a Māori community. Right. A lot of Pākehās think we have all this stuff, collaboration, trust and all that. In fact, it's not true. You know that. I know that. So this seems to be a fundamental part of the endeavour. We've got 30 to 50 years to do it in, so we don't have to try and have it all done by the next three. But the thing is to be able to be focusing that, admit to ourselves that this is a need. Build the trust, build communities and collaborate. Build the trust, build the communities and collaborate. Then shape tribal, hapu and Fano entities to meet that purpose. I will say that in some of the studies we've done, the model of economic development imposed on us by Crown agencies um, is the opposite to this. And so a settlement is a step, and that's all it is. But the settlement, as, as we are all experiencing, is turning out to be a nightmare for a lot of people. And it's not necessarily, I think, a fault of, the, of, of individuals or peoples. Some of the structures that are put on us, the types of companies, types of charitable trusts, all these things uh, 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 are not modelled on collaboration. They're modelled on separating out and dividing people. So, so we have a lot of thinking to do in that area. And then finally, you know, what, um, well, part of all this stuff. Uh, stuff, stuff Kia ora, stuff too, is that right? Building this trust and then building new types of business enterprises. Tenakwe Manuka. Tenakwe. 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 He tāonga mō tātou katoa. He whai krori ki āi ki te runga roa. He mau ngā rongo ki rungi te mata te whenua. He whakāro pai ki āwai ki ngā tāngata katoa. Ora kau he pātai nō hea. He mangu mangu, he haina mangu. He mani he tāngata, he tāngata. Nei rā te kōra roa o tēnei ki a tātou. Nō reira, kei te mihi atu ki te whānau nei. Kei a tātou, te mutunga o hene kōra. Ke roho piri tātou ki a tātou. Ke haopai, ngā wawata o tātou mātua tīpuna ko hurikitua o paira. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe, e hoki mai ki te haukāinga, i te hakamana, wā rātou kōra tēnā koe.